Eric, uh, we're going to be talking in a minute about uh, Roger's uh, conformal cyclic cosmology. We just had a very riveting discussion about the Weyl curvature hypothesis and whether or not we even need a theory of everything, whether or not we even have reason to believe that there are singularities in space-time. Um, uh, I said to Roger, the only instances they appear uh, are forever shrouded from our view, either in the deep ancient past of the universe, at the, at the uh, origin of the universe, our current uh, cycle of the universe, if you will, or perhaps hidden at the core of black holes forever inaccessible, as Jana points out in her book. What say you? Are singularities real? Are, are we just kind of fooling ourselves? And if they're not real, uh, why do we need a theory of quantum gravity? I guess what my read on it, and in part your work, sir, is um, that this is the key to understanding that Einstein is really only an effective theory because I don't believe that those singularities will be there in an ultimate theory. And the fact that they're shrouded by mystery and that they're sort of protected so that we sort of can prove that they have to be there at this level of theory, but on the other hand, um, we can't really get at them because they are in fact screened from us in one way or the other for these two different types of singularities. Is this, sir, the indication that Einstein must be effective or could it be in some sense an ultimate theory in that sector with these singularities, essential features of space-time itself? Is this an artifact of our description or is this in fact um, how the underlying structure likely is in your opinion? And if I need to rephrase the question, and I'd love to get back to the vial tensor, but that would be the opening. You see, when I first wrote my papers on this, I don't think I tended to use the word singularity. It's just we don't know what happens at that point. Stephen Hawking was more um, bold about using the word singularity. I think he meant, okay, as far as the th classical theory is concerned, we have a singularity, so it gives up at that point. I mean, like with the shock wave, you might say the the uh, theory of laminar flow or whatever it is and aerodynamics gives up and you have to have another theory which describes the shock wave. Um, so it's the argument would be something like that. So general relativity, as we know it, would not apply to what happens. But whether there's any useful future to, to the situation. You see, you might say the very notion, notion of your space time and what it means to say, talk about the future makes no sense at that point. So in the absence of any theory, it's telling us that our theory of space time, general relativity gives up at that point. It doesn't tell us if anything happens. I mean, what does it mean? You mean anything you took into that region might get destroyed and then doesn't mean anything to say it continues. You see, this was an argument Stephen made, uh, which I would have agreed with, you see. Here's, here's an irony, you see. I would have agreed with this argument. The Big Bang, you see, was the beginning. You may say what was before the Big Bang. Well, it's meaningless to talk about what was before because the very notion of before is a space-time space notion, and therefore it doesn't make any sense to talk about before the Big Bang. And I would have said, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And here am I contradicting myself. <laughs> <laughs> See, if you've got a theory, then you can maybe go beyond what you had before. So I, I don't agree with the argument that it's meaningless to talk about before the Big Bang. I better not, because I'm talking about it. <laughs> Yes. So, Eric, both of you guys have had, uh, you know, controversial but provocative new theories that push the boundaries of the accepted uh, dogma. I think in many circles, uh, you know, uh, Sir Roger is sort of a, a hero or a precursor to some of the work that you're trying to do now. Uh, certainly he is for me. Uh, I want to turn to his uh, to his conformal cyclic cosmology, which is my uh, area of, of expertise, such as it is. And, and talk about, well, first uh, first of all, what's it like to be on the avant-garde of physics in, in a good way, to work without a tightrope, to uh, pursue things that may not have answers? Uh, what does that feel like for, for you, and what kind of inspiration do you take personally from someone like Sir Roger? Well, I mean, first of all, Roger is oddly, of course, uh, singular in our in our pantheon of living physics heroes as being, I would say, almost everyone would say, the most generative of our first rank of physicists. So that he is, he is less constrained um, 
because in some sense we're in such a late stage of physics that almost every interesting idea is dead on arrival. And so having any ideas at all that aren't immediately dead on arrival is very, very difficult. And I think that one of the things that this Nobel Prize is going to do is to send a message to future generations that um, it's okay to be highly generative, you just have to do it in a radical and conservative fashion simultaneously. So that the math is extremely, um, you know, it's impeccable stuff. And on the other hand, uh, it's also wild stuff. I remember seeing the, um, the newsletters from the Twister group back before <laughs> the internet. And it, this was like Sama's dot. We weren't sure whether people were taking drugs in Oxford or what was going on, but it was florid and it was in its own language and it was clearly shared by a group of people. And I, I just think you, you have to think about Roger Penrose as, as like Sun Ra, the great jazz artist who had a, a cult and a commune in his house, but also produced some of the best music around. This is really a throwback to that tradition. It says that it's possible that Roger could have done this if he wasn't at Oxford as well. <laughs> I would say the one thing that I want to be really clear about is also bringing back hardcore geometry rather than always coming back to the quantum as the source of weirdness. I think one of the things Roger has done through his artistry and his ability to depict what can barely be seen um, is to show us the wonder of geometry that is now underneath all fundamental physics as uh, post Jim Simon's work with CN Yang. And so right now we're living in a world that's purely geometric in which most of the public discussion of physical weirdness is about the quantum. And so I think Roger renewed that Einsteinian connection and the sort of Simon's Yang connection um, by making this relevant. But I would like to get off a technical question yeah. just while I've got it. Of course, go uh, for it. You talk a lot about the vial curvature tensor, which is the part that gets killed um, when we write down the Einstein field equations. It's the part of the curvature that's sort of uh, thrown away with the bones and the skin when we formulate the Einstein field equations. On the other hand, it's also weirdly the part of the curvature, as per the Chern-Weil theory, that contains most of the topological information about the nature of the space on which it resides. What do you make of the fact that we throw away the portion of curvature that tells us about the, the holedness and the donutedness of uh, potentially of space time, but we retain the portion um, that is complementary to that when we write down the Einstein field equations? Is that a coincidence? Does it have greater significance? Well, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but the way I would look at it is not in this respect too different from electromagnetism, because there one has the Maxwell field, and you have the charged sources. So in general relativity, the an analogy, according to me, it wasn't perhaps the way other people would look at it, but according to the way I would look at it, you see that the vial curvature is very analogous to the Maxwell field, and when you write it in spinners, it's almost you know, just the same equation you write in. So it's the vial curvature is an analog of the electromagnetic field, and the Ricci curvature is the analog of the charge. So you see you, you have matter with charged matter that gives you the source to the Maxwell field. And here we have the, the Ricci tensor, which gives you the source to the Weyl field. So it's not so different in that respect. I, I'm, I think I'm looking at it a bit differently from the way you are. Well, it's interesting because I wouldn't have because the Maxwell theory doesn't break into pieces, whereas the Riemannian or Einstein theory does break the curvature into pieces, yes. I, don't, I don't think I've ever heard that. Which I don't is, know how I, it's a question of order of differentiation, you see. Yeah, I mean, there is a different order of differentiation because when you write down the Maxwell field and the charge, there is a different level. But the, in, the, in the Einstein theory, the Ricci and Weyl curvature are the same level. You see, the, people think of them as the, as the as the curvature tensor. I think it was when I wrote these things in terms of a spinner form, which made these things look more different. See, the bar curvature is looks, you know, just four indices rather than two, but it looks awfully like 